Hello, everybody, and thank you very much to all of you for joining us for this, our fifth and penultimate BRT UK lunchtime masterclass, in which uh, we're going to take a trip across the Irish Sea to hear from Tim Gaston of Ireland's Transport National Transport Authority. Uh, and it'll be my pleasure to introduce him properly in just a minute. If this is the first time you've joined one of these masterclasses, I am James Freeman and I'm chairing today's session. I took over as chair of BRT UK shortly before I retired as managing director of First West of England, based in Bristol, where Metrobus was introduced three years ago. BRT UK has been around for 15 years or so, and it was uh, back then that the patron of guided buses, as I like to think of Dr. Bob Tebb, uh, felt that a ginger group was needed to put the case for rapid transit using buses. Our purpose is to spread knowledge and good practice in the field, not just of bus rapid transit, but also for high quality bus operations generally across the board. And we've really enjoyed putting on these lunchtime masterclasses and thanks uh, for all the positive feedback that we've been getting. But I'm really glad to say that we will have an in-person conference next spring. It will be based on Merseyside at the Liva building in Liverpool on the 16th of March 2022, with a visit to the Lee Guided Busway on the previous afternoon on the 15th of March. So please do make a note of those dates. Meanwhile, here we are, just an hour this lunchtime this Thursday. It's short and sharp and we'll be done by 1.30 in this our fifth and penultimate lunchtime masterclass. So to introduce Tim, Tim Gaston is Director of Public Transport Service at Ireland's National Transport Authority. He started his working life in England after graduating in mechanical engineering from Edinburgh, Scotland, and he worked in manufacturing and transport logistics in particular. He moved back to Northern Ireland and after two years in link local industry, he joined TransLink, which, as you will know, is the provider of almost all public transport in Northern Ireland. There, he project managed the development and implementation of SmartLink and the senior SmartPass, Northern Ireland's smart ticketing solution. Then in 2003, he moved down to Dublin to lead the development of what became the Leap Card scheme, which is Ireland's equivalent to Oyster and is now the dominant means to pay for public transport across Ireland, with over 5 million cards in circulation. But it was in 2015 that Tim moved to his current role, where he oversees five teams in the National Transport Authority. He must have plenty on his mind because his responsibilities, can't speak this morning, include managing all contracts for services, the licensing regime for commercial bus operators across the state, rural transport services, including demand responsive and scheduled services across rural Ireland, network planning, including the large recently launched Connecting Ireland programme to improve service provision across Ireland. And the responsibility that specifically interests us today is that he is overseeing the implementation of the Bus Connects network redesign projects. Tim is married with one son, and he says he is passionate about public transport, cycling, and amongst other things, skiing. As ever, we have just the time until half past one for Tim to talk, but also to answer your points and questions. He has split his narrative into three sections, as is our custom on these lunchtime masterclasses, to allow some time for questions and brief discussion. So please put your points, be brief and clear in the chat, and I will do my best to pick them out and put them to Tim when we pause for questions. As usual, the programme is being recorded and a significant number of people watch it after the event. So, Tim, it's my great pleasure to welcome you as our lunchtime masterclass speaker this Thursday. Over to you. James, thank you very much indeed. Uh, I'm hoping I'm coming through loud and clear. Yes, yeah, oh. so thanks for the introduction. Uh, as you can see, I'm Tim Gaston, Director of Public Transport Services in Ireland. And I'm going to talk about and uh, use the tr try and tested approach. Why did we consider Bus Connects to be necessary? And a little bit of a history uh, that so just to, to understand what happened a few years back and why we are where we are. Um, we'll have a few questions on that if there are any, and then we'll move into what is Bus Connect, what will be delivered, uh, what's part of the overall program. And again, I'll pause because that, that'll be quite a, a heavy session. And then over to the when and how and what uh, and where 
and, and find a little bit about updates, status update as to where we are at the present time with the programme. So that's what I'm planning to cover. Um, I'll move fairly quickly through the slides because I know you'll want to ask questions, so I'll not be dwelling too long on these and I'm happy to come back to any if you do want to discuss it. But the starting point for why in a role like mine, I'm a public servant, has to be public policy. So what is the public policy that's guiding us um, and, and is driving us down this road? And there's three main strands to that. There are others as well, of course. Uh, in Ireland, we have a national development plan which is through to 2027. There's a new version of that just recently been published, uh, which shows how Ireland is going to evolve as a country. And in fact, there's a programme called Ireland 2040, which features a lot about transport, as you would imagine. There's the national planning framework, which is the framework within uh, government that ex really guides expenditure and sets the policy objectives and targets for that. And, and more recently, the Climate Action Plan, the first version was 2019. There's a new one just been published, uh, which um, NTA and public transport is front and centre, which is where it should be because we're a major contributor to CO2. Therefore, we need to take responsibility for, for dealing with it. But as I said, history plays a part in this. And if you just go back to your minds to uh, long before COVID to the, to the previous recession, 2008, 9, 10, public transport took a huge hit in Ireland as it did in many other places. We started to see recovery, and as you can see in this slide, by, by 2012, 13, 14, we we're beginning to see things improving. By 2019, we'd seen a 40% increase in, in public transport, and it was continuing to rise. So in 2017, what was the state of play in Ireland? Well, congestion was the big issue. There hadn't been any during the recession. Uh, the roads had gotten a lot quieter with the level of unemployment and the lack of economic activity. That started to change dramatically. And as you can see, even by 2016, we'd seen a significant increase in the M50, which is the orbital. Likewise, in connecting motorways, M1 to N3, as a, a connection that should have take should take sort of 10 or 15 minutes, was taking quite a bit longer for people to 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 navigate. And the impact of that was beginning to be felt on the economy. Uh, and this slide was one that we used in the initial launch of um, the connecting out the Bus Connects program, which showed that there's an economic impact to congestion, which is pretty obvious, but it's there. Uh, and we called it out reasonably early and said this is something we need to do something about. And the challenge in all of this is what's the impact of public transport? Well, as many of you involved uh, in bus operations will know, congestion means longer journey times for public transport as well as cars. Uh, and tries we might to put in bus priority, we had some, but not enough. And we had very significantly longer journey times. Therefore, peak vehicle requirement was considerably higher than we felt it needed to be. Um, and we had to do something about it. So we had presented this to government, to the people, to the politicians, and we said we need a programme to address this. Um, and that's what I'm going to deal with in a minute when I get into the details of what is Bus Connect. But I thought I might just pause at this stage on the policy and the, the what was happening in the street uh, level and see if there's any immediate questions that people want to bring forward at this stage. It looks like we are in the clear, Tim, so uh, uh, carry on for the moment. OK, well, we'll keep keep going. So what is the solution? I'm sure you've all seen these pictures. Uh, they show the difference between people in the cars and then they're in buses, of course. Um, but we did come forward and very clearly and loudly said to uh, the people who mattered in Ireland, the politicians and to government, Department of Transport, that we had to do something pretty dramatic uh, and we had to do it pretty quickly as well. Um, and then we also said we need to do it faster than we can do it with steel on steel, whilst train and tram services are fantastic ways to move large numbers of people. They take many years to, to plan, to develop, to get planning permission for and to implement. So we did come forward and said the answer actually is bus, certainly in the immediate future for the, for the decade that we were looking at. Um, and we said it's bus in our cities in particular, and for the focus on Dublin, because 40% of economic activity in Ireland takes place in the capital. So um, there was a major problem coming with congestion, and there was a major opportunity to do something about it, which was Bus Connect. So that was the, if you like, the, the, the basis of the, of the programme. So what we presented then was this, uh, which is a, a, a relatively bold programme, I guess, of, uh, of activity that we wanted to see uh, being, being addressed in rural Ireland. I've lost my apologies. I've lost the, done something silly here. Yep, I'm back with you again. Apologies. So 
we had to uh, set about addressing, first of all, the, the bus network itself, and that's the program that I'm involved in, one of the programs I'm most direct, directly involved in. So we were a complete redesign of the bus network um, that uh, works in the city of Dublin. It hadn't been refreshed for a, a long time. Dublin Bus had made some significant changes to it um, in the early part of the noughties, but apart from that, there hadn't been much work done on the bus network, and it was a typical network where everything ended up in the city centre. So we set about a complete redesign of that, and I'll come back to that in a second. Um, probably the most contentious piece was we said we we're going to bring in a, a, a network of next generation bus corridors. Initially, there were some of them we referred to as BRT and some of them we referred to as just um, high quality bus corridors. But in fact, we settled on this term of bus corridors because um, much of what we were planning to deliver would be close to, but not, not quite meet maybe the spec for BRT. So we settled on language there and I'll show you the detail of what, the, what those look like. Ticketing plays a major role and we also needed to refresh our ticketing system anyway, and we we're already looking at an account based solution. So we determined that we needed a completely refreshed ticketing system. We needed a simpler fare structure and we needed to be able to move cashless to support the move that, that London and other places had already uh, brought in place. Park and ride was a, an early feature in it. Um, it's still sitting there. I'll talk a little bit about that hasn't hasn't moved to the speed that other elements have. Uh, we wanted to bring in a new bus livery. We wanted new stops and shelters. And of course, we wanted to move to low and then zero emission vehicles. Um, so it's a pretty comprehensive program. We weren't changing the driver's uniforms, but we were changing just about everything else. So we were setting out to really set about changing how people use bus in, in our cities. Just running through uh, one or two slides on each of these elements then. On the ticketing side, as I said earlier, moving to an account based, which is about choice, about saying to people, fine, you've been using a leap card up to now, um, 70, 80% or more. In fact, now probably 85% of people using leap cards, smaller amounts still using cash. Um, we needed to migrate that across to a modern platform, and that's about using essentially um, any of the, could be a barcode, could be a bank card, could still be a leap card, of course. Um, and, and that then gets taken to a back office, the activities of the back office rather than the front office, which allows you the improved um, opportunities that come with that. Likewise, in cycling, we recognised there was a huge opportunity to increase where we were going with cycling, and this was was pre-COVID. COVID has brought a further impetus to that in that we have been able to, to really ramp up our activity. As you can see in the slide, budget 240 million for cycling and even more uh, and the budget for next year and growing to such an extent. We have a minister who's very, very head of the Green Party and he's very keen cyclist himself. And we're seeing huge strides being made uh, in greenways between um, centres of, of population and then also priority and other facilities going in around the, around the city. Walking as well, uh, clearly as a part of the active travel piece is in there. Um, and we work very closely with the local authorities in delivering the, the cycling piece. But part of Bus Connect is to put in about 230 kilometres of um, high quality um, cycling network around the country. The vehicles themselves, we're in the process of changing. Uh, the government gave us fairly significant funding, but the sting in the tail was that from 2019 on, we couldn't buy any diesel only vehicles. So we had to move quickly and we moved to hybrid. Um, we've had a large order of hybrid vehicles coming through in the city in Dublin and in other places. And Galway is now fully uh, moved across to hybrid in Dublin. We still have quite some way to go. I'll have a slide later that shows the sort of migration path for that. Um, <coughs> then we've now stopped buying hybrid and we're moving into fully electric. <coughs> Excuse me. We've orders in hand for single and double deck um, fully electric vehicles that will start arriving later on next year and the depot upgrades and so on that go with that. So quite an extensive program there uh, that will bring. Um, and really, it's about taking a lead. Public transport and government, I think, need to be shown to be taking a lead and addressing the problems that are that are so evident uh, from the climate action piece. So the fleet itself looks a bit like this. Uh, we changed the livery. We deliberately went for a very strong yellow front. Um, our colleagues in the, the disability organisations tell us that that is the most visible way for a bus. They can see it coming down the street from a long way. And then the green is the new livery that we're putting out as part of this greening process, if you like. Um, and livery, it's one of those topics that uh, people get very emotive about. I don't quite get it myself. I, I 
much more concerned about when the bus turns up and and, and so on. But still, uh, we did put quite a bit of effort into it and we consulted quite widely uh, to get the views of people as to what should the vehicles look like um, and when they're, they're now out in the streets. And if you're next in Dublin, if, you, if you're over for another rugby match, if you want to come to Dublin to give people a good hiding when they come to Dublin these days in rugby, um, but you'll see the, the buses out in the, in the streets. That's the road layout that we I was talking about earlier that we're moving to, and we're aspiring to achieve this um, everywhere. Now we can't because um, you know the Georgian Victorian areas of Dublin clearly just will not support that. But in many of the streets, we will achieve a dedicated footpath and dedicated cycleway, dedicated bus in both directions, and then uh, a space for cars. And when this program first came out, it was highly contentious. Uh, we went out for consultation, and we got. Uh, quite a hammering from the media. Um, and in some cases, uh, I suppose we understand why people were most concerned. They were losing trees, they were losing spaces of the garden, they were losing car parking spaces. And we had to do a huge amount of work at a local level with residents groups and with local representatives. But um, the good news is that we largely managed to achieve that. There are still some areas that need to be finalised, but after a lot of work on the ground, uh, we've moved to the point where there will be 11 or 12 odd corridors coming into Dublin, which will give us that much increased speed that we need to be able to, to manage a much better um, bus network. The bus stop infrastructure is changing as well, and we're also moving to bus spot stop specific timetabling. Um, that, that's easy to say and difficult to deliver, uh, actually getting it to the point where you've confidence that what you're putting onto the bus pole um, is accurate. But we think there is still a need for information on the bus pole. Yes, we have RTBI, real-time passenger information. Yes, it's available on apps and we have some street signs as well. But nonetheless, we do think for, for, for many of our customers, we still want to have a feel for when the bus is likely to turn up. And certainly in the, the less frequent areas, that's more important. Where you've got high frequency, clearly that, that that's less of an issue. And we've also changed the style. We're moving to a stainless steel pole with a yellow carousel and the, the green and yellow top. Park and ride was part of the original plan. We have identified where we think there may be park and ride initially. Um, it's not part of the core program at the minute, but it is something that will come into play. Um, and if the, the obvious park and ride places are, are to expand uh, or implement where they're not there already, where it interfaces with, with the light and heavy rail. So park and ride isn't yet moving rapidly, but it will be integrated into the program over, over a period of time. So this is the core bus uh, corridor network that I was talking to you about. Um, this shows the, the, the radial approach and all the major routes coming into the centre of Dublin will then be covered with that uh, layout that I was describing earlier. The redesign of the bus network then was something that we, we took on uh, with enthusiasm. Uh, we went to the market and we uh, brought on board uh, Janet Walker Associates, it's a, an American based consultancy, but uh, they do a lot of work around bus network redesign. They've got some interesting ideas around how to set about changing a network. And we did a, a lot of work also with Dublin Bus and Go Ahead, the two main operators that we have in the city, uh, to develop what we thought was a pretty dramatic new network. Um, and we followed the, the principles that I, I guess many of you will be familiar with, where we have the core spines, which are high speed cross city corridors. To, to take people from, with all, with the exception of one spine that isn't across city, the others are to so take you from northwest to southeast and so on, with um, a lot of interchange opportunity in the centre, um, supported by a network of orbitals, and in turn those supported by a network of local services. So for many people, quite a significant change in how they will make the journeys um, into the city. The other principle is about a more all-day service, so uh, we still have a focus on the peak, not hugely at the minute because of COVID, but we, we, we do still have peak traffic because of schools and third level education. But we expect to see um, more all day travel, more weekends and more evenings as well. And we find when we put those in that the patronage actually responds very um, successfully and those have been good changes that we've made. So I've got two slides here that I'm just going to flick backwards and forwards between a little bit. This slide shows the network as um, as it largely was before we started the design work. This shows where we are now. 
Uh, and this is just the high speed. I didn't put all as uh, high frequency services. You put all on here, it, it, it blurs. You can't see the, the differences. But if you just, if I flick backwards and forwards again a couple of times, you can see particularly here, there's uh, S2, S4, S6, A8. There's, there's four orbitals. There's two northern orbitals and orbitals in the west. And then some of the other local areas, you'll see quite a bit of fill in as well, where there's a fair bit of additional network coverage. So hopefully that gives you a sense of the scale of change that we were bringing in and we're adding somewhere in the order of 40%, um, it might even be slightly more by the time we finish, of additional root kilometres um, and of course significant additional cost coming with that as well. So that's our, our end game if you like, that's where we want to get to, that's the, the network map that we've produced um, and is on many a wall around Dublin. Uh, and we're now in the process of rolling this out, and I'll touch on that later on when I give an update on the status. But it does mean that for uh, almost all residential areas of Dublin, having a car is a nice to have now. It's no longer an essential. Um, in other parts of Ireland, car ownership certainly still gives a, a level of flexibility that, that, that public transport can't yet match. But in Dublin, and we hope, and, and our plan is to, to roll out to other cities as well, people will be able to move much more freely using public transport than they can even using their car when you bring in then the act of travel, the walking and the cycling. We expect and hope that that will bring a much improved opportunity for people to use public transport and drive up passenger numbers. So I'm going to hand back to James and see where we are with questions. Yes, and of course they've started, Tim, uh, to come in thick and fast, and our problem will be um, uh, uh, rationing ourselves so that we don't end up finishing at half past three. Um, so uh, interesting recent uh, uh, comments come in from Will Salt. Um, how do discussions and agreements with developers work with respect to incorporating new developments into the bus network? Uh, what are the key challenges in achieving increased integration? Um, it's a good question. One of the powers that NTA has is that we are responsible for the transportation strategy for the Greater Dublin area. It's a statutory responsibility. So any development has to have our, our agreement in effect, and that gives us huge leverage when it comes to major developments to say, let's make it move public transport friendly. The problem we've had is that that wasn't the case in, you know, in re even relatively recent history pre-NTA. NTA has actually only been in existence since 2009. So there are many areas of Dublin where permeability is an issue, where the road network isn't sympathetic to bus transport, and th those areas are major challenges. But going for, build up from really from uh, for the last 10 years, uh, the NTA has got increasingly involved with developers and with local authorities at an early stage to influence um, development. We're, we're getting better at it as well. Some of the some of the early uh, instances where where you know, we look back and think we, we, you know, we could have done that even better, but that's why we tend to handle development and, and integration uh, into those developments as well. Yeah, very interesting. And uh, I mean, it makes a big difference if you can get in early. Um, uh, uh, it, sort of carrying into a slightly different angle, what are the policies around uh, private car restraint, if that's the right word, to help deliver all these bus improvements? Um, yeah, that's a very good question and congestion <laughs> charging as in London is a hot topic and, and Ireland, so I need to be careful what I'm saying in a recorded uh, message. But essentially the transport strategy, actually the Dublin transport strategy is out for public consultation at the present time. And we do in that make it clear that to achieve the carbon plan that Ireland has, which is to be a 50% reduction of uh, carbon emissions by 2030, um, is, is is actually hugely challenging. And to do that, people are going to have to get out of cars. Now, if they get into electric cars, you could argue, well, that, that, that's less of an issue, but that's going to take time to filter through. So we have put forward in the past thoughts around congestion charging. We've put that, and there's a more immediate plan likely to, to land shortly on um, sort of speed restrictions and increased speed restrictions, man managing demand on the M50 and some of the other major motorways. We also are looking at, as part of the Dublin strategy, to um, use the hard shoulder for, in places for bus priority. Um, and then the City Council working very closely with us, and we we're very supportive of Dublin City Council, have taken out a huge number of city centre car parking spaces. So it's actually right. quite difficult to find somewhere to park in Dublin. <laughs> uh, the cost has gone up. So it's 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 kind of subtle. And interestingly, on the back of COVID, one of the things that the council did that, that had an immediate impact was to increase the uh, pedestrian cycle time on the traffic signals. That alone uh -huh. just reduced the flow of traffic into the centre because there was there was less mm. 
time for cars, more time for walking because there were we needed to, to give people more space in the footpath and that sort of thing. OK, thank you. Time is short. So one last uh, question. I'm going to actually ask two together. Um, uh, is the simplified fare structure integrated with the Lewis trams? And uh, did you go straight to totally cashless operation? And uh, is there still demand from passengers who want to pay cash? They're talking about fares there. Yeah, yeah. We haven't gone to cashless and won't for some time. The and I'll explain later in the status. The next generation ticketing project is at a procurement stage, but it's going to take three to four years, I suspect, to really materialise. And I think we need that in place before we can move to cashless. On on although we may move cashless in some of the high frequency corridors where we may already be at ninety five percent or more people using Leapcard. Um, the uh, sorry, the the earlier question was about Luas. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yes, indeed. Mm. Of course. Yeah, yeah. Um, we've we've just announced uh, that on the 28th of November, coincidental with the second phase of the network redesign, we're launching something calling TFI 90. TFIs are Transport for Ireland. You know, you work out where we got that name from. So okay. TFI 90 allows 90 minutes of travel from when you start a journey because uh, our bus network is touch on only. So when you start a journey, you have 90 minutes to start any subsequent legs that you want to take within pretty much the whole metropolitan Dublin area. And that covers all bus, all tram or Lewis as we call it, and most of the rail network. The outer two zones of the rail network, there are increases in fares and the limited stop high speed bus network, uh, which is a uh, relatively small number of services, there's a premium. But for everyone else, it's a 90 minute start a journey. The fare is two euros 30. Um, and for that, you can travel pretty much right across the city and out the other side without any difficulty. You can jump off a bus and onto a tram and off a tram and onto a train and so on. So that's uh, actually and it's landed really well as well. Got some really good media coverage in that mm. and, and uptake. Um, and that goes live across the entire Dublin region on the 28th of November. And what's the sense of um, uh, uh, whether that's going to cost money or make money? The modelling would suggest it's going to cost money, particularly at a fare of 230. The, 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 the sweet spot was around 250, but we decided to go in at a lower fare to, to, to do a couple of things to, to make it, uh, you know, like a promotion, if you like, at the start. So the 230 fare will last through until the end of March. Um, but also we thought at the time it was a good idea to try and encourage people back onto public transport. Um, there's been a few announcements recently where government are trying to hold back enthusiasm for people to socialise. But at the time of uh, launching this and uh, doing the doing the technical work, 2.30 seemed like a good idea. And I do still think it is a good idea to put in something like that at an attractive fare. Um, and that fare for most people is a, is a reduction or in some, in some cases a very significant reduction actually in what they might even be paying for a single leg. So the, yeah, there, there is some cost attached. Not, not enormous, but there is some cost and we needed some funding support from government to do it. Yeah, and they were willing to give it? They gave it. <laughs> right. OK, let's move on then, Tim. OK, thank you. Thank you. Those are good questions. So how are we going to deliver this? Well, um, public consultation is what we do with three on the go at the minute. They're connecting Ireland, which is a rural transport plan, the transport strategy that I mentioned for Dublin and the Cork Bus Connects plan are all out for consultation. So, of course, we did an initial consultation, consultation on Bus Connects and got a very positive response back from the public and from public representatives. And that was grand. Then we went into the intensive round of detailed consultations and unprecedented response on uh, when we went out with the first redesigned bus network, the work with Jarrett Walker, ourselves and the bus companies. When we went out with that, we had over 70,000 responses. We've never experienced anything of that scale before in Ireland. That, 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 that's enormous. Um, so that took us somewhat by surprise, but on the other hand, it was really, really good. We got some fantastic feedback as to where we should be running and weren't and, and why we'd got it wrong. So that gave us a chance to do a pretty significant redesign, but happily we were able to retain the core principles of the spines, the orbitals, the local services, the cross city, the fair structure and so on. Um, and that then led to detailed designs of the network that was published and I, sh I showed you a few minutes ago the slide of the full network. So that's how we did it for the network redesign. Corbus Corridor actually followed a similar pattern. They went out with an initial um, plan of what they were planning to do, got a very significant pushback and postback to deal with and then met at a local level with lots of residents, lots of public representatives and thrashed out 
where they needed bus priority, where they needed an, an alternative alignment for the bike, where they needed a bus gate or one way traffic. All of those features were, were brought into how to maintain the principles of high speed corridors coming into the city to give the bus uh, you know, a very, very distinct advantage. The ticketing project, we also already had a well-developed plan for an account-based solution um, and that has now launched and as I say is in procurement. And um, the, the planning process for the bus corridor proposals, that's on board Planola as our planning authority. We hope to get that in. It'll be very early into the new year now. Um, and the other how I suppose, and it's not on the slide, but I'll just talk to you briefly, is we had to convince government that this was the right thing to do. So a business case has been prepared. Um, that's with government at the minute. That shows that there is a very clear benefit to Ireland uh, in doing this program and delivering it fully. There's an economic benefit, there's social benefits, there's um, health benefits and so on. Um, so in terms really, it's just how it was, it was tough at times and it was hard going, but uh, we stuck at it. We believed in it and we managed to convince the paymasters that it was worth doing and we're now reaping the benefit of that and that we're getting the, the funding. The other happy coincidence, I suppose, was um, the, the real focus in the last two or three years on climate action, and that allowed us to advance probably faster than we originally thought we might in the electrification of the fleet and so on. So, um, yeah. Where are we doing it? We're doing it in Dublin at the minute, and uh, we're just in the middle of, as I said, the, the ticketing new ticket is launched on the 28th of November, as is the second uh, of the um, spine changes on the network. That's the, the look and spine, the C-spine has been launching on the 28th of November. But we also have um, a well-developed plan in Cork, which is out for public consultation at the present time, uh, following a similar process. Cork isn't at the same scale as Dublin. However, there's a massive opportunity to put better public transport into Cork. Uh, there's a real upgrade happening as well, but the bus will be the, the, the workhorse and we, we do plan to make a very significant change to bus transport in Cork over the next sort of two or three years. We have just finished uh, the initial plan for Galway. Uh, it still needs some refinement and we hope to go out for public consultation on that during next year, implement it the year after. And then we'll also follow through with Limerick and, and to some extent Waterford. So the plan is to, to roll out bus connects across all of the, um, the main cities in the state um, over the, the next sort of four or five year timeline. And that's just how to, if you want to, to go click in and find out what's going on in Cork, um, you'll understand, see the same sorts of principles that I was talking about about Dublin a minute ago. So when is it all happening? Well, um, some of it was able to, to get progressed quite quickly. And as you can see, the, the network, the top left, um, that's underway and I've said we're two, one spine done, second about to go. We plan to do two or three phases next year. We've broken it into an, an 11 phase plan to roll out the network. We recognize that Big Bang just would be impossible to manage. So the network is being rolled out over 11 different phases, but that's well underway and, and going very well and showing immediate benefits and results when we implement it. The Corpus Corridor, uh, we're anticipating construction will start in 2023. A lot depends on planning permission and getting through the planning process. Uh, but we hope to go to planning permission very early next year uh, and that and any changes that come from it should then lead to getting into construction in 2023. I put 20 question mark, question mark, but we, we're not just entirely sure how long it is going to take to roll out that program, but that is being developed at the present time. As I said earlier, the ticketing piece is a procurement and that's, uh, that's underway. Um, as is the, the fare simplification happens, as I said, on the 28th of November. Cashless will follow uh, the implementation of an account based solution. Uh, and I'm not, I wouldn't want to put a timeline on that. It's likely, I suppose, to be of the sort of 2024, 2025 timeline, I guess. Park and Ride, we have an office now in place. We are starting to develop the program, but that hasn't uh, advanced too far just yet. The uh, the livery is being rolled out uh, as we're not we're not we're not repainting everything all over uh, over a short period of time. New vehicles are coming in with the new livery and existing fleet as it's due. It's mid life update gets that and uh, is being being reliveried. The infrastructure, the stop infrastructure that I was talking about earlier, the steel poles and the carousels, they're being rolled out at the present time. 
pretty much across the whole city, but we're trying to align those with the network redesign as well, so that as we launch a new section of the um, the network redesign, that at the same time we we also um, bring in the the new uh, bus poles, and then as I said earlier, the hybrids. We've pretty much that order nearly completed, and then the zero emission vehicles start to roll in next year. So the program is well underway. Government are thoroughly well behind it. Um, Bus Connects features in the Climate Action Plan and the National Development Plan, and so on. And and the biggest clamour, I suppose, the biggest pressure on on me and on the NTA is to is to bring this to other cities quickly as well. So we are under pressure to to roll it into Cork, to Galway, to Limerick, to Waterford. Um, I'll put up this slide really just to show that um, these things are are tricky. I mean, you need a you need a strong project team to, to manage this. We certainly uh, took uh, soundings from other cities that had done something similar. So we have a dedicated team who work on this, and and our approach was to take the strong people from their day jobs, put them into this team, by and large, and and then backfill and use your capital funding to, for the backfill for the period of time that you're doing it. That's working reasonably well, but we still need to, to to fill some more slots in those teams because at any given point, if you look at the dotted line of today, we're actually actively working on about five of the phases. So we've just finished the eight spine. We're reviewing that lessons learned. We're just about to launch the C spine. Phase three is in more or less ready to go and planning for early part of next year. Phase four, the infrastructure pieces are being finished off that we need and uh, the detail planning has been done with the operator as it is with phase five and, and so on. So at any given point, when you have a phase program like this, you're working on so many phases at once, um, you do need a strong team to oversee it and manage it. There will be something similar on the Corbus corridor side, um, and it's all about having you know good, strong project management processes and people to allow you to deliver. This slide just shows the uh, two things, the Corbus corridor breakdown, um, and, and where we envisage those being. This is a slide from the, the GDA strategy presentation. So the 22 to 42 doesn't, isn't the delivery timeline. That's simply the, um, the, the title of that slide. And then what I do like about this slide, it shows the migration fully diesel to part diesel hybrid through hybrid diesel zero through to fully zero um, and that comes with a with a you know at a cost of course but at a at an operational penalty as well there's the challenge of electrifying depots there's the operational changes in the interface between the operating and the maintenance teams and so on so um that's the, if you like what i was going to say on the on the how just uh, and on the when by, by way of then just status, I've probably covered quite a lot of this already, but just briefly uh, updates. The final network for Dublin is, is published and being, being rolled out, set in two phases, in, in 11 phases, and the second one to go live uh, this next weekend. So there'll be a lot of activity there. Park and ride in hand, campus ticketing underway, hybrid double decks here, electrics on their way, sorry, on their way. And um, Yes, nobody's asked the question about price yet, which is very kind of you, but um, I'm not going to give out an absolute figure on this because it will depend largely on the tendering costs that come in for the core bus corridor. That's the major capital piece in the programme. The capital spend on the network redesign is, is, um, is fairly modest. It's mainly people. We need an operating increase, uh, which could be in the order of 50 million per annum additional subsidy by the time we're finished to, to handle the additional um, public service obligation funding that we get from government. But the capital spend will be two billion plus. Um, government are committed to that, and we have always had the capital funding that we've needed year on year to support whatever element of the programme they're at, be it bus purchase, network redesign, and so on. And then, as I said at the bottom, budget for next year, 360 million for cycling schemes alone. That's a tenfold increase from where we would have been three or four years ago. So again, a major focus on cycling. And that's it. Done. Apart from questions. Well, there's plenty of those. So. <laughs> oh, sorry, <laughs> there, no, no, not quite, James. If, if I might just briefly, sorry, I have one further slide. I've forgotten. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is just my throwaway <laughs> closing remarks, if you like. There is a lot of other stuff going on in Ireland at the same time, just in case you think we're getting bored. So I mentioned Connecting Ireland. That's our plan for rural services. The strategy in GDA, the Greater Dublin Area Strategy is out for consultation, as is the Cork and Galway Metropolitan Strategies are under various stages of development. 
They we're doing a program in our towns as well, with towns like Carroll that have no town service. So we have a program to roll those out over the next few years as well, and we're getting, starting to get funding for that. Dart, that's our East Coast um, heavy rail network. There's a significant expansion and electrification happening there as well. There's the bus depots that need to be electrified. COVID, look, it's there. We need a recovery plan, so there's quite a bit of work going on in that as well. There's the cycling, and then, oh yes, forgot to mention it, we're also replacing the AVL system, and that's gone out to procurement at the present time as well. And this time I'm finished. Thank you. Over to you. Yeah. James. It's uh, incredibly uh, comprehensive, really, isn't it? And um, uh, it's amazingly encouraging. Actually, you looked at from this side of the channel, I, I'm, I'm getting a bit uh, envious, but um, uh, as many a slip twixt cup and lip, isn't there? Let's uh, just talk about integration uh, for a minute. Um, uh, so do these plans include any integration, sort of mobility hubs and mobility as a service and those sorts of things? And uh, do community transport services fill the gaps where there are not commercial possibilities? Um, or are uh, 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 all of these new routes uh, identified in the revised network able to be accommodated by large, what you might call, what we would call on our side of the channel, uh, um, uh, commercial buses? And what about bike and ride? That's another um, another uh, area of interest. Uh, um, you know, bike sheds at bus stops and tram stops and train stations and so on. And of course, there's DRT just to add in as well. Um, what about all of that, Ross? Yeah. yeah. Okay. How long have we got? Um, just taking those in turn. Bus mobility as a service is a is a fantastic concept. Um, However, we we believe, and I, I think we're probably aligned with UITP and others, that if public transport isn't at the centre of it, it's never going to really fulfil the vision that's there for a door-to-door, -door, complete end-to-end -end service for payment, for planning, um, for for alerts, for notifications, and so on. So we are building the and designing the NGT, the Next Generation Ticketing System, to support lots of other. Um, micro and, and smaller mobility suppliers into it and in the meantime Dublin City Council are also working on if you like a pilot for Dublin for the recycling scooters, scooters cars by the hour and so on so we're, we're very aware of mass we're very aware of the potential but we believe that the key element for us the key role of the authority will be to get the central platform in place and make sure that the hooks are in place to bring in the the um, the last mile first mile stuff and so on there's also legislation going through Ireland at the minute to uh, to re legislate how um, electric scooters can be used because at the minute they are on the footpaths and on the roads and in some places they are they're, they're a real nuisance at times so we want to, to regulate those we don't want to not have them but we just want to make sure that they're they're appropriately being brought into the solution in terms of integrating into public transport they not part of directly part of bus connect but as part of the cycling program the, the active travel program that actually got an acceleration during COVID, there's been quite a lot of additional, uh, for example, my local train station, there's bike lockers have gone in and facilities for cycling have gone up very significantly. However, bike and ride, um, not on bus, at least not at the present time. We've yet to see uh, a, a sort of successful city version of that. I know in some longer distance coaches, it, it is possible if there's still storage for bikes to be carried, but in cities, we, we haven't seen a model that we think would work and we haven't particularly investigated that particular one. Um, community transport stroke DRT, uh, we have investigated. Uh, I've been over to the UK to look at a couple of schemes, Oxford and Liverpool, very attracted to that. I think that has a real potential, perhaps on those um, areas that are sort of semi-urban moving into nearly rural, there are parts of the GDA that would cover that sort of description where there isn't the density to justify, you know, a, a regular service to large buses, but there may well be uh, a justification for DRT. So yes, it is on the agenda um, and it's something that we plan to look at actually under that Connecting Ireland banner rather than Bus Connect, but it, it, it could well be in or near to cities that we do and we may even do a, a pilot next year. I, I would like to do that. It's something that we're working on. So That's very interesting. Covers uh, uh, your, your questions. 
Yeah, no, very systematic, actually. You managed to work your way through all of them. Uh, um, just to, uh, whopping across uh, um, to a slightly different angle on all this, I noticed that the 28th of November, which is um, like Monday week or something, it's not very long away. Um, there's a lot changing then, isn't there? Um, yeah. Whilst there must be loads that you're very pleased with them and proud of, not everybody in Dublin will love what you're doing. And, um, you know, change provides friction. Um, how how are you coping? It's sort of in terms of the the media uh, um, view on this, and 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 uh, um, are the media supportive generally of what's going on? Are there communications lessons that uh, uh, you've already learned, and or we ought to be learning? <laughs> well, the answer is yes, no, and maybe I suppose in equal measure. Um, <laughs> to people like change. <laughs> Indeed. Well, it's Sunday, Sunday week, so we're very focused on it at the minute. There's a fair number of meetings happening. Okay, We've done a lot of consultation in advance of this. One of the challenges, though, that that, that terminated, that was that finished a couple of years ago, and then we did the detailed design and now we're in rollout. So whilst people were aware of Bus Connects, they didn't have to really engage because it was some point in the future. Now there's a booklet landing on your doorstep saying this is what's changing So from Sunday week. You'll no longer be able to take a single bus into town that, that leaves every half hour. You'll actually take a local bus to go to this hub interchange point to get on a bus every five minutes into town. Now, we know that overall that gives a better service. However, if you're used to going to the end of the road and getting on a bus and trundling into town, you don't sense that to be a better service. So there's a piece there that's beginning to filter through to people um, and change inevitably will bring reaction. We were very aware of that. We work very closely with Dublin Bus and with Go Ahead. They have significant teams on their customer relations and management side. So they'll be taking all the original, the initial queries, they'll be filtering out the ones that are directly to do with their own operation. You know, I was this bus late, the driver was rude, I left my umbrella and so on. And then the network ones will land with my team and we have a team that will uh, be dedicated to dealing with those network issues for the main reason that we don't want to campaign to build. If there's uh, a large enough group of people complain to a number of local representatives, quite rightly, they will say, well, hold on, this is wrong. This is not what we thought was going to happen. Um, and there's a risk of a campaign building. So we want to move pretty quickly on those. And that would be a lesson we've learned from earlier experiences that mm -hmm. um, you stop a campaign building by by engaging. And it's all about yes. engagement. So. Yeah. Uh, for example, this coming week, uh, we have three sessions with all of the local councillors in areas affected or near to areas affected. So local councillors, TDs, our word for MPs, we even invite in the, the European MEPs um, and we give them a briefing and an opportunity for Q&A. And those sessions are fairly intensive, but um, <laughs> they do go a long way to, to taking the heat out of the public representatives. And then, as I say, with the with the public, um, we uh, we deal pretty much face to face. Media, um, I love a bit of controversy, of course, and an opportunity to to get at government. So they they'll pick up on some of the negative stuff. And we're aware of that. Um, they they will find a number of people who will claim to be significantly disadvantaged on a part of this network, and there'll be some negative news stories. That, that mm -hmm. that's an inevitability of change. However, if people on the ground actually then use the service and can get into town and realise, do you know what, I actually am in faster um, and I have more options and I can get further than I used to. And of course, coinciding with that fares change, which for most people is a, a reduction in cost, uh, we believe that that will take some of the, the pain out of it. That's interesting, isn't it? Yes. Uh, um, I, I mean, I've come across uh, politicians who uh, listen intently in those sort of meetings and then when their post bag starts to fill up with um, difficult stuff that they then turn turn and become much less easy to deal with. Have you, have you encountered that? For, for sure. And as I'm saying at the very start, when we came out and said Bus Connects was going to give everybody a better network, and you, you're on a you know an online survey asking people, would you like a better bus service? It's no huge surprise that over 80 percent say, yep, it would. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Um, even if it means you have to change bus. When you then, as I say, present it, and it means that the bus that used to stop 100 yards down the road isn't there any longer, and they have to walk 300 yards, and you know, God forbid, they also have to then change service to get to where they want to get to. That that's less attractive. They complain to the politicians, who of course then come on to us, and and we face it, and they go on to government, and they 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 get onto the media as well. So all of that is going to happen. 
um, but we've been there before and and we we know we have good connections into political, particularly in the political world and we stay very close to the, the key politicians and to the Department of Transport and to our minister and that he's hugely supportive actually and, yeah. and he will take some of the flag on our behalf which is which is very helpful there's no sense of this oh well that's an NTA issue had nothing to do with me um, the government don't don't play that piece which is good and uh, so they're very supportive that's very important um yes, changing, right. changing slightly um our attack uh, are you looking at doing anything differently in measuring performance and reliability post network redesign implementation uh, well interestingly we had a completely separate strand of activity um some years ago we established a, a strong contracts team and we have two main types of contracts in, in ireland with directly awarded contracts with the large state-owned operators, so Dublin Bus, Bus Air and, and Irish Rail. And we've tendered contracts with um, Go Ahead in Dublin and then with other operators in other parts of the country. And as part of that um, tendering, we call that bus market opening. It was opening up the, the bus market, so it wasn't just the large state companies that provided it. We also set about significantly tightening those contracts and bringing in a level of KPI with both um, reward for good performance if you like but penalties where uh, performance dipped and we focused in on reliability and punctuality uh, and, and i mean it's it's really basic stuff um people are going to complain if the bus just doesn't turn up regardless what color it is and how nice the driver is the bus ain't there you you're, you know you haven't got past first base so reliability is hugely important and then does it turn up in time which is punctuality of course and then for the high frequency we've also moved to um uh, we've been measuring for some time using our existing um automatic vehicle location system to measure excess waiting time so we have got targets and they've been gradually tightened that we expect our operators to achieve in punctuality, reliability, and excess waiting time. And then we've also introduced mystery shopping um, and fair revenue coverage because the contracts are by and large gross cost contracts, so we're taking the revenue risk. So we're also now measuring their uh, the mystery shopping sorts of things. You know, is the driver friendly and with the driving style? Is the vehicle clean? Um, and also, what's the fare loss uh, and penalties follow if uh, those move outside of the the thresholds? Mm. Just um. Thank you very much for that. Uh, going back a bit in, in the whole process, um, how supportive of the needs of the enhanced or the need for the enhanced bus services were uh, and are the highway and traffic engineers, uh, um, the Gardaí and, and the local planners? Yeah, th those are good questions. I mean, the local traffic engineers in Ireland are split into two camps. There's the national road network, including the motorway network, comes under the auspices of Transport Infrastructure Ireland, TII. Um, and they're very supportive. We work very closely with them. Um, they also happen to be the agency that's that delivers Lewis um, and also the, the lead agency for Metrolink, the underground to the airport and swords. So we work very closely with them and in fact, they uh, they might almost be NTA engineers in their approach that the two are almost synonymous. So they have over a long number of years now have been working with us to, to put in the bus priority, the bus stopping places, the interchange management and so on that we need. However, at a, the, the, for local roads and, and in our cities, it's the local authorities that we have to, to work with. Um, and that's been more of a process, I guess, where some councils are further down the road than others and recognising that actually um, if you take away the car parking, the world doesn't stop. You know, there, there's a general view that the only people who go shopping are people in cars, uh, and, and all of us know that that absolutely isn't the case. However, um, convincing sometimes local authorities who can be widely influenced by car park owners and, and other business units that, that taking out car parking to put in bus priority is a challenge. So we've been just nibbling away at that. Um, COVID gave us a really good opportunity to, to drive that agenda quite significantly further forward um, and the funding for the 340 million for the cycling schemes is actually mainly being spent by, by local authorities so that gives us a bit of leverage as well yes you want your greenway well guess what we need 20 kilometers of bus priority in your territory as well so the two go hand in hand and and that that's that, that we're beginning to turn that corner pretty well the Gardaí is another interesting one um the Gardaí are, are by and large 
sort of agnostic to the planning side of things, but uh, they have a lane involved in traffic and uh, they're certainly very supportive of uh, public transport. I meet the assistant commissioner on a regular basis. A lot of that discussion is around antisocial behaviour, but also we do talk about traffic management and they work closely with us. And in fact, there's legislation going through shortly to address uh, tightening up the opportunity to penalise people who park in bus lanes. And, and uh, so, yeah, uh, we, we do that jointly with that's, the it, that's quite interesting, isn't it? Because pol policing of these things is quite an issue. You can have it's the most enormous. wonderful system of it. If it's not properly controlled, then it's not much good. No, that's right. It, it's crucial. Yeah. Mm. Good. Well, uh, I suppose, as uh, uh, Roger Sexton says in the comments, that the crucial test is the 28th and, uh, and do these connections actually work? Uh, um, <laughs> and do people have good experiences? But yeah, certainly yeah. Uh, um, listening to what you've had to say today and to tell us, and thank you uh, really very much indeed for, for um, taking us through this so comprehensively. I think we, you've managed to give us a really good picture of um, what you're uh, seeking to do and how far you've got with it. So um, uh, we very much uh, look forward to seeing how this all works out. I mean, it is a daring moment, isn't it, when you tinker with things that have been around for a long time. Uh, um, and uh, you do need to be brave. And it, it sounds, it feels from what you're saying that with government, uh, you know, behind this and, and supporting it both uh, financially, but also actually, uh, when the t going gets tough, you've got a real proposition here and something for us uh, to look at from across uh, the RSC and and, uh, um, and and take a real interest in, in how well you do with it. So um, uh, thank you very much. So, uh, we're really most grateful to you, Tim, for taking the trouble and time today uh, to uh, um, address us and tell us all about this. Um, and thanks, uh, uh, turning now to everybody else, uh, to you, uh, our audience, for your interest and for all your comments and questions. Um, don't forget that uh, we have been recording this programme and it'll be available through Land or Links. It's a moment now for me to thank the team behind the scenes at Land or Links, especially Daryl and Juliana today, who uh, worked so hard to make the whole thing work and today work. Um, Incidentally, and following the success of this autumn season of lunchtime masterclasses, that the BRT UK board is considering whether we might run some more next year. And if so, um, here's a question for you. What topics would interest you? And indeed, uh, speaking to each of you individually, would you like to be uh, chosen to give a, a future masterclass of our own? If uh, so, uh, please do contact me, James Freeman, via the BRT UK website. Now, the same brilliant team behind these uh, masterclasses is working with us at BRT UK, as I said earlier, to bring you our first post-COVID in-person conference in Liverpool. The date to be watching is the 16th of March 2022 and the day before it, if you're interested in the visit to the Lee Guided Busway. So do, if you're interested, keep that day free and those days free indeed in your diaries and watch for further details. Now, next week, a week from today on Thursday, the 25th of November is the sixth and indeed the last of this uh, session of lunchtime master classes. And this is uh, called a bus infrastructure for transport decarbonisation, embedding carbon reduction. And our speakers next week are uh, both from WSP, uh, Thomas Gold and Simon Pope. So uh, in the conclusion to this programme, do remember to register again for next week and join us at 12.30 on Thursday, the 25th of November. So Tim, Thank you very much again. And to all of you uh, listening, uh, thank you very much. This is James Freeman signing off for BRT UK until next week. Goodbye.